Molly, that's not very polite. This is Molly, and this is Charlie. Charlie, they both need some help with personal space. This is their roadmap to success. I have a cookie in each hand to try to keep them here in the shot. Um, as you can see, it's very hard for them to resist. They want to accost me. They want to uh, you know, drool on me or paw at me or uh, nudge me. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And because they're used to doing that to the humans, and the humans respond. So during this session, we went over a lot of ways we can add structure using positive dog training. Anybody who watches my stuff knows I absolutely have no tolerance for people who practice dominance theory. I'm not here to punish a dog or force a dog or create pain or discomfort. It drives me nuts when I see trainers use these prong collars. That's inappropriate. Uh, because it, it, the reason it works is because of the pain or the threat of pain. I want my dogs to want to do what I want them to do. Now, in this case, they really didn't have a lot of rules to sit. That's kind of a dominance move, so I wouldn't allow the dog to keep its paw there. Um, yes, you guys do not have the softest mouths, so we'll just give you those. Ah, that's still my fingernail. Um, all right, so uh, for me, what, what dog, for, is, dogs are all about what they see us do. We don't have rules. We're not very consistent. We're also not repeating things very good, and we don't have good timing in our corrections or rewards. Those are the three factors that dogs uh, basically learn by. Consistency, repetition, and good timing. You have a window of three seconds to correct or reward your dog for them to make the connection as to what it is. But it takes a lot of repetition. Just once is not going to be enough. I have some in my pocket, buddy. You're going to have to wait for those. Uh, please not, don't drool all in my pants again. Uh, all right, so um, as a result of that, I like to incorporate a lot of rules because that allows the humans to practice acting like a leader by consistently enforcing them. So some of the rules we talked about, not being allowed to uh, be on the furniture. Now, right now, the Guardians, uh, this is a rule they're trying to incorporate, they're using tinfoil on the furniture. Um, but we want to try to do this without tinfoil on the furniture. Now, if you're leaving the room, that's a good time to put the tinfoil on the furniture. You can't pay attention, you put the tinfoil. But if you want to teach the dogs not to go on here, we want them to have access to it and just correct or disagree with them when they do the wrong thing. So maybe when we're in the room, and there in here, maybe we're on the kitchen, we're working on some stuff, and you can watch the dog out of a corner right, we remove the tinfoil, the dog stick goes over to it, we're gonna use the escalating consequences to disagree. It's not working as well with him as I would like, but eventually they will work. Uh, sit. So basically, we give the dog the opportunity to do the wrong thing at a time when we can observe and intercede appropriately within, again, that three second window. If you're gonna go, you know, turn your back and be cooking or have your hands full and you can't deal with it, put the tin foil back. But we wanna give them an opportunity and help them practice and teach them what is or is not allowed. In this case, you're not allowed the furniture for a minimum of 30 days or as long as these problems are still going on. At the end of 30 days, maybe the humans decide or whatever the period is, uh, that I'd like to invite Charlie up. I make the invit invitation by tapping and then he's allowed to come up because I have invited him. I'm in control of the resource. That is a little bit of dominance theory, but it's important to have structure for dogs, otherwise they'll roll all over you. And clearly these guys have no respect for personal space, probably because they get rewarded when they do invade people's personal space. So basically, um, uh, that would be, uh, you're not allowed the furniture without, permit, without an invitation, and when they do invite you eventually, that's only for good behavior. So if you're on the couch and then you start barking, you have to get down. Or if you're on the couch and you get, uh, with invitation, you wanna get a drink of water, when you come back, you need permission to come back up. They get up without permission. I turn and I say, off, one time. And say it like you're stern, like you mean it. If they don't get off, what I, for dogs this size, I would put my hand on their collar, pull them to the edge of the couch, but not all the way off. I want them to be teetering like this, so they feel unsteady. When a dog feels unsteady, it will improve the situation by moving to stable ground. So when it gets down, I'm gonna reach over and pet it and say the word off. Um, that way that we're building in a reward or a command for this and rewarding the dog for doing something we, we ask them to do. And for dogs, because the higher they sit, the more rank or status they have, rewarding them when they get down is a little bit of compensation for basically a demotion. Um, okay, so that would be rule number one. Rule number two, the dog should not be within seven feet of any human who is eating. Even if, even if they're not actively begging, it's inappropriate that distance. So we're gonna use the escalating consequences to move the dog away. Now, uh, since we, uh, the family normally eats at the dining room table, which is directly behind the camera, maybe what we do is we practice and put the dog in a position to succeed by practicing and teaching them the behavior we want. When we're eating, we want you to stay seven feet away. When we're eating an actual meal, that's hard to do because we're trying to shovel food in our mouth and keep the dog away. So what we might do is set the table. And instead of putting food on the table, right before we do that, we grab a piece of uh, roast beef, microwave it for about 20 seconds, 
then uh, pull it out. It's going to be steaming and it'll have all sorts of gorgeous aroma to the dogs. Go over there, cut it up into little postage stamp slices and put a piece on everybody's plate. Everybody goes and sits at the table like it's a real meal. Now the dog comes forward, we can use the escalating consequences to disagree with the dog and establish that invisible boundary using the third escalating consequence. And we do this when we're not preoccupied with eating or the conversation or the interactions we're having at the table. So we practice this uh, uh, once before the meal, and then once the dogs lay down and, and start respecting the boundary, then we put the roast beef up or somebody can eat it. Um, and then we actually grab the real meal and serve, and now the dog had a practice round. Again, I talked about this off camera, but a lot of what I try to do is recreate situations where the dog's behavior is not what we want it to be. Play with the elements, take some things away so it's not as intense, help the dog practice one step of the behavior at a time, and don't move on to the next step until you get the dog to behave that way properly. We usually like something we call five for five. We want the dog to do it correct five times in a row, five different iterations. That might be a little bit much, so maybe just five times in a row, then we're ready for the real meal. Um, now we're teaching the dog when there's food at the table, your job is to stay seven feet away. I don't tell them to sit or sit there or do something specific, just you can't come that close. Uh, all right, uh, another rule the dog which, which should have to sit before they, we let them in or out of a door. Start with whatever direction you want uh, or is more important for them. So if the dogs really want to be outside, we start with them inside. Tell them to sit. If I say sit and neither one sits, after about three seconds I walk away, sit down, watch TV, read a newspaper, grab my phone, play a game, whatever it is. Give, tell Siri, give me a 60 second timer. Then in 60 seconds, go back to the top door and again, tell them, don't ask, sit. They don't say, this time I walk away for two minutes, next time for four minutes, next time for eight minutes. I keep on doubling the length of time until they sit. And as soon as the butt hits the floor, if he sits down, I would open the door and let him out. I would not let her out. And I would walk away and repeat the process. Keep going over and over again, Charlie's trying to photo bomb, uh, until the dog sits as soon as you say it. Because now you're controlling the resource, and if the dog wants what it wants, or to get what it wants, it has to do something for you. This is a great way to train your dog without using a treat. It's by putting a motivation or incentive ahead of the dog and asking it to display a, a, a desired behavior before you give it what it wants. So start with, if the dog would rather be outside, start with it inside. But eventually you do it both sides. And eventually what will happen is the dog will come and sit at the door and say, look, I'm sitting to tell you I want to go outside. We've helped it establish and practice learning a new behavior to communicate something to us. So I, I use passive training, uh, which I'll talk about in a sec, but the same thing for the dogs on the couch. If they get on the couch without permission, I would say off one time. Let's say the dog jumped off, I would reach over and pet the dog and say the word off. If I say it within that three second window, now I'm creating a positive association and creating a command word at the same time. Uh, this is the benefit of positive dog training. Uh, let me see what else. Um, other rules, uh, not being allowed in the kitchen when people are eating food. Also, I'd like the humans all to start uh, claiming their personal space. These dogs, as you saw earlier, are all that are costing and molesting everybody who comes in if they have anything the dogs want. So again, that's a good opportunity to have a couple treats in your pocket and sit down, and the dogs try to come over. We use the escalating consequences to disagree. Now, we have a little bit of an ottoman in front of the couch, and the dogs like to shove their way through there. They shouldn't allow them to do that. So if people are sitting there, and it's, if they can go by without touching anybody, that's fine. But if they're shoving, the person has to stand up immediately turn, walk to the edge of that area. So if the ottoman is right here and the dog's over here is coming trying to wedge, I stand up and I walk this way. I'm turning to face the dog so my authority is pointing at the dog. I stop at the line so the dog knows where the edge is. When the dog stops moving, I take one step back. Left foot, right foot, stop. Dog comes forward, I hiss and move back towards uh, to block the dog. I mean, it's, it's gonna seem like a dance going back and forth, but eventually take step, two steps back, left, right, not a third shuffle step, just boom, boom, stop. And then if he stays in place, let's say the couch is here, then I would turn and I would pause. Now when I turn, if the dog comes forward, I turn back and rush towards them. So I'm gonna keep repeating that process until I turn, and now my authority is pointing there, but the dog is staying there because I've taught it what I want. And uh, we're gonna have a little bit of excitement here in a second. Um, and then I stop in between each step so that the dog understands I'm like punctuating. I'm not just meandering around, I'm actually communicating something right now. That's why we pause one second between each step. Okay, so that's, um, a, those are some examples of some of the rules that we went over. Um, something else we did was, uh, it's important to recognize that whatever the dog is doing when we pet it is what we're reinforcing. If the dog invades my personal space and I, reward, and I pet it, I'm teaching it that it's a proper way to ask for attention. These guys are pawing at people and doing all this stuff. That's why we went over pe uh, petting with a purpose. But if we come home and the dogs are super excited, the kids and everybody should not pet the dog. Don't tell them to sit, don't tell them to do anything, just ignore them. 
Now, once they settle down, then you reach over and start to pet. And if you reach over to the dog, the dog starts wiggling, pull your arm back, walk away. Just do your, own, your normal thing. Once the dog settles down, you can reach for it again. Some dogs, you have to go first time you're here, second time you're there, third time you're there, fourth time you're there. Can you do that in a second for me? Thanks, sorry. Uh, so eventually you can get to the point where you can get all the way where you're touching the dog and it's staying four on the floor and calm. We're teaching the dog being calm is the way to get me to engage with you. And just like humans, when we're, dogs are overexcited, that's when they're going to be more apt to make a mistake or to do something incorrect. And so we want them to be calm and balanced. Remember, excited is not happy. Excited is an unbalanced state of mind. It's more positive, but it is still unbalanced. Uh, and don't pair the pet them when they're fearful. A lot of women like to do this to try to soothe. This is what a skill that makes them such great mothers because you want to soothe your charges. But if he's afraid, if Charlie's afraid of thunderstorms and we pet him when it's, the thunderstorms are happening, we're going to enhance it and make it worse. For his thunderstorm problem, I talked about this in the video above, when you have a dog that's afraid of thunderstorms, the best thing you do is take it out in a thunderstorm. Usually we go outside when it rains, we come back and say, Jesus, man, it was raining. The dog's like, well, that looked like a horrible experience. I do not want to go through that myself. But if we put on a raincoat and a hat, and then we go out in our intention, I'm going for a half an hour walk, we're not doing all this motion. For a couple minutes, the dog's like walking on the street. Come on, let's go back home. It's still wet. After a couple minutes, they realize, hey, this is okay. I can drink water as it comes down. I can splash. I can have fun. And I, because dogs get over things by literally moving forward, after a couple walks, the dog sees the thunder or sees the lightning. That'd be impressive they can see the thunder. Uh, but they hear the thunder, see the lightning, and nothing bad happens. They continue walking. Now, if he's really reticent, the guardian can carry some treats with her. And then every time the dog, what I usually do is in between every driveway that we pass, I stop somewhere, tell the dog to sit, pop the treat in his mouth as soon as it sits, and keep walking. If you pass 30 driveways on a walk, and every time he passes a driveway, or every time you stop, he, sit, he sits and gets a treat, after a while, he'll start sitting in, in advance as soon as you stop. Then you're walking down the road, you're walking down the road, you ran across Patty, and you stop, and he sits down, and you had Patty have a conversation, and you're like, oh my God, he's so good. I mean, he used to jump up, and I, how did they do that? And you're like, well, we hired a dog on problems. No, but you're teaching your dog, when you sit, you're rewarded for doing so. Sitting is a more subordinate position, which is why I asked him to sit before we let them in or out of the door. Also for dogs, whoever's in front is considered the leader, whoever's behind is the follower. So if they race up and down the stairs ahead of you, teach them to stay at the bottom of the stairs, walk up the stairs, and then call them. Come up with a command word for that. You can use passive training for that. Same thing with the dogs outside. So the dog's outside, you want it to come inside. Maybe you take a treat and you throw it inside. When the dog comes inside, you pet it, or you give it, a second it takes the treat in its mouth, we say inside. So now we're creating a vocabulary, and inside means come and get the treat. Now, a lot of dogs don't want to come to us when we call them when they're in the backyard because we're really, the way that we use uh, the commands really is a buzzkill. We only call the dog when we're leaving the dog park. We only call the dog when we're leaving the beach or when they're coming in from outside. They're having a good time, and now suddenly I hear come, and I come inside, now I'm not having fun anymore. So you want to use as much iteration of this as possible. So go outside when the dogs are playing, have a treat, say come. I would, since there's two dogs, I say come. Whoever comes first sits, gets the treat, and then I come back inside. And then maybe I do it again uh, three or four times, and then the fourth, and each time I do this, maybe I'm a little bit closer to the door. And eventually, now they come to you because that means I'm going to get a treat. Now, I started saying I'm not only giving one dog a treat. A lot of people go out of their way to make sure that both dogs get a treat, to be fair. But if one dog gives me A-plus effort and one gives me a C effort, and I give them the same grade, there's no motivation for the C student to become an A or vice versa. So in this case, uh, for two dogs, I would say come. Whoever comes and sits first gets the treat. Whoever comes second doesn't get anything. When they start coming at the same time, then you can go back to giving them both a treat. And in this house, we've, uh, they've really kind of stayed away from treats, and I think that's uh, sapped a little bit of motivation for the dogs. I'm going to leave the tricky trainers here, but I'd like to see you order a couple bags of those and have some available, and have, carry them with you. Just because you have them doesn't mean you have to give them to the dog, but if you have them, you're in a position to give them to me. If you don't have them, there's no way you're giving them to me anyway, so why should I listen? It's a nice little incentive and a little motivation. Um, all right, so for us, they have to sit at the door, at first going outside or going inside, whatever way they want, and in both directions. Um, let me see, other rules that we went over. Um, I mean, uh, I think we covered most of them. The guardian can uh, message me if she has any questions about it after. Um, to help the dogs develop a little bit more respect, we went over uh, how to add a little bit of structure to petting them, which I call pet, uh, petting with a purpose. So that means every time the dog comes to us and nudges us or scratches at us or demands attention, we're not going to do it because that tells the dog that it's in charge of me. That gives it the perception that it doesn't have to listen to me. So instead, when the dog nudges me, I'm going to say sit. When the dog sits, I pet her on her chin and say the word sit. Because remember, when a dog feels good, its nose is elevated in the air. 
So I put it on the, under the chin, I say just the word sit, not good sit, not good boy, not potty, or whatever it is, just the command word. And don't say, and, and the guardian said this once, I forgot to mention this to her, sit, Doug so sat, she went, sit. <laughs> That's a different sounding word. So we want to say consistently. There's nothing wrong with baby talking to your dog. You should always baby talk to your dog if you use that, go that route. So uh, coming up with, uh, and that's one of the things I recommended the guardians do is actually sit down with a list of commands. Right now, these dogs know sit down and come. It's not a lot of skills. So one of the things I'd like the guardians to do, first of all, is make sure we write a list so everybody is saying come. In a lot of families, it's one person says come here, one person whistles, one person taps their thigh, somebody says the dog's name. Now the dogs have to listen to memorize all these different commands. So we say vocabulary. We have a list of the commands on the refrigerator somewhere. And if the word is come, and I say, I'm saying, come here, and somebody says vocabulary, I go, come. And I say it twice when I give a dog a command. If I told the dog to sit, I say as a command, sit during the command stage. When the dog sits, I pet it, and I say the word sit to reinforce during the reward stage. So I'm saying it twice. Once to tell it what to do, and then once to remind it that for doing that, you get the reward and link the reward with the command word. Uh, okay, so passive tr uh, petting with purpose is one of the easiest things you can do if everyone gets in the habit of doing it. Remember, if we come in the room and we see someone's petting the dog and standing, we say paycheck. That person has to stop petting the dog. We say sit. The dog sits. We pet on our chin, say sit, and we just tell the other person. I asked him to sit before he came in. He, I, he stood up when he heard you coming, and I continued to pet him, and David said that's okay. Uh, even if you want to pet him, still ask him to sit. And I would do it with both dogs. Even though she's by far the much better behaved dog, she still is no, nudgy at certain times and does some things and just teaches the dog. After a while, the dog will come and sit in front of you and say, look, sucker, I'm sitting. Why aren't you put me, petting me and giving me attention? We call this manding or learning to mand. It is a beautiful thing to teach your dog to do. It also teaches your dog, I can't tell the human what to do. I have to ask for it. And I pay for it through the currency of obedience. Um, let me see. Uh, the other thing that I like to do is something called passive training, which is simply waiting for the dog to do the right, the thing that you want and marking it with a command word and then rewarding it. So I talked about it a little bit about coming inside. So when the dog comes inside, we take a treat, we throw it inside. When the dog comes over and touches it with its mouth, we say the word inside. After we've done this enough, this takes a couple months, but now the dog inside means if I come in the house, I'm going to get a reward. So you can do this for, with anything that the dog does on a regular basis. Every time the dog comes to you, you should pet it and say come. Every time the dog sits next to you, put her and say sit. I like to use the word crash. I think the guardians are going to use this. So every time the dog lays down with you, within that three-second window, reach over and put it and say crash. And I can scratch the butt. I don't have to scratch on the chin. Um, just we want, to try, we want to avoid patting on top of the head. That's the one thing we don't want to do. Um, also, if the dogs are in our way, walk through them. If you walk around the dog, you're deferring. Leaders do not defer to followers. And over time, that can give the dog the wrong impression that it's in charge. So if it's in your way, Walk through it, bump into it if you need to. Its job is to learn, or my job is to get out of the human's way. Now if the dog's asleep, I go, get up. That's just being a jerk, so don't do that. You can sleep, it's okay, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. But just make sure the dog understands that when the human's coming, I need to defer out of their way. Again, that's one of those subtle ways that we help the dog identify as a follower. Also following through, if, we tell her, if I tell her to sit and she gets up and walks away, I'm gonna get up and follow her like a zombie or a mummy. Not aggressively, I'm not yelling sit, I'm not angry about it, but I'm following her. And eventually she goes into a room with a door. I close the door behind me. She finds herself kind of cornered. That's why we do it very casually. Then I bark out, sit. And when she sits, I just turn and walk away. She has to understand that when I ask her to do something, it's important enough for me to follow through. When you do that consistently, and the family really needs to do this for the next month, after a while the dogs will start doing and complying faster and faster because they realize you're not going to give up. You're going to get your way one way or the other. I might as well just do it now and get it out of the way. Then I can go back to chasing my tail. Sorry, buddy, you don't have a tail. But no, or whatever it is. Uh, let me see, what else? We went over a focus exercise. I don't have video footage on that above, but if you go uh, through my website or message me, I can send you a link. Um, remember, one second, one second for each movement. And you're watching his eyes. As soon as he looks up at you, raise it. Make sure you're holding it about four inches in front of your nose so he's looking at your face and the treat at the same time. Then go straight towards his mouth. Don't say the word until after the treat goes in his mouth. Anytime you give a treat, the treat should be delivered. The command word should follow immediately after. Um, and at first it's one second, one second. I do about 10 or 12 treats for all of them. One second, one second. It takes a minute or two. Everybody in the family could do this uh, once a day with the dog. That'd be great. Eventually he'll start staring at you the whole time. Then you go one second, two seconds for all 12 treats. And everybody, you know. And then eventually you get to the point where it's, it's, he looks up at you, you go focus, or well, you wait for him to look at you and then you go one second, one, two, three, and you go all the way to 20 seconds and he's staring you in the face. Now, if you're going to 15, for 15 to 20 seconds, 
And at, 15, at 16 seconds, he starts looking away. Well, then back up and practice at 15 over and over until you get five in a row where he, does, he just stares at you, then go to the 16. Um, but um, try to make sure that you're not jumping in the middle. So if you start off with one second, they all 12 treats are one second. Um, let me see. Um, the other thing we went over is teaching them to stay, and that's the video above, so I'm not really going to talk about that one. But I'd like to see everybody in the family practicing that with uh, the dogs once a day. That will really help accelerate the process. Remember, first for duration, then for uh, distance, and then for distractions. Um, and then uh, if everyone in the family tr uh, picks a two dog commands or tricks to teach him, I like every Sunday or Monday or whatever day of the week that works for the family, one person, and they're going to check with mom and dad, the kids will, and I'm going to teach him how to play dead. And then they teach the kid how to do that. And if you go and you find one YouTube video and your dog's not responding, look for a different video. Sometimes there's different ways of teaching the same thing. You should be able to find them on YouTube pretty easy. Make sure the tricks are not too hard either. So once uh, somebody's taught him how to bang your dead, then all week long we practice that with both dogs. And then the next week, another member of the family takes one of the dogs to the side, trains that dog, and then takes the other dog to the side, trains that dog, and then all week long the family practices that one uh, trick as well, or command. And this way, at the end of the, we have 12 kids, or 12 people in the house, so that's like 12, uh, or excuse me, six, that's like 12, she, the guardian was rolling around, she's like, there's six other people I don't know about. Uh, but that's 12 new commands, just like us, that builds the dog's self-esteem when they accomplish or uh, ascertain, or when they uh, accumulate new, uh, new skills. And so right now they know three of them. So if we double, we go to 12, that's a huge, significant boost. I think for him, he's, his separation anxiety is pretty minor. Um, so it's really manifest the worst when it's a thunderstorm. I think a couple walks in thunderstorms, as I talked about, is gonna help him get over that fear. And I think also adjusting the leader follower dynamic through consistently enforcing rules, heading with a purpose, rewarding desired actions and behaviors through passive training, practicing the focus exercise, practicing the stay, and helping him practice the stay once he's got it down. Stay, and I go to the bathroom. Stay, and I go to the garage. Stay, and I go fold some laundry. And each time it's a little bit longer, a little bit longer, I think it's gonna take care of both of these dodge problems. Also, remember your personal space. You should have a one-foot bubble of personal space. I think the guardians are so used to the dogs jumping up and nudging, they should reach over automatically and start petting them. So make sure you point that out for other people. I can claim someone else's personal space here. So maybe Brian's got some crackers in his mouth like we joked about earlier, so somebody else hisses for him. Or somebody else, maybe uh, mom has surgery and she can't stand up, so somebody else stands up and gets in front of her and does it, does it for her. So we want to make sure that we're working as a team, and that's why when we come in and we say paycheck, the people don't argue, no, I asked them to sit, you didn't see it. No, because that means that we're all on our own page. We say paycheck and everybody stops, gives you another practice, opportunity to practice sitting again, and then it shows the dog that humans are all together, I'm the outlier. For dogs, one of the worst punishments is to be excluded from the group. So, uh, and the guardian is doing a great job right now. Of, uh, uh, that was perfect. Now he's coming to me, looking to see. Well, I give him attention. Sit. Sit. That's a perfect example of petting, petting with a purpose. All right. Well, this is Charlie, his uh, sleepy friend here. Uh, uh, I would say Maya, but uh, Molly. Molly. I knew it was an M name. Yeah, I, so you're, you're, I didn't work with you as much because you're the better behaved dog. Also, for, uh, for feeding, make sure we're structure, feeding in a structured way. Dogs spend 90% of the time in the wild looking for food. So if we just put food in their bowl and let them go willy-nilly, sometimes we lose an opportunity to have them respect us a little bit more just by simply asking them to eat on command. And that's why I use passive training. So maybe her word is grub and his is chow. So I would probably feed her first all things equal because she has more of the behavior we're looking for. And then when she goes to eat, I, when she takes her first bite, we say, grub. And every time she takes her first bite, she hears the word grub. He doesn't hear his word grub, but there's no food in his mouth, so it doesn't mean anything to him. Maybe, but every time he takes a first bite, he hears the word chow. So after two months or so, maybe three months, you say chow, and he goes, that means I have permission to go eating. I would feed the dogs one at a time. Now, here's the important thing. Dogs eat in the order of their rank. So this is usually when I ask the trick question to the client, who should eat first? And they always go, uh, her, her. no, the human should eat first. It doesn't have to be a real meal. That'd be better if you can. But if you're just gonna grab a chip or cracker, something that takes five or more bites. It has to be a solid, it can't be a smoothie. I don't understand coffee or smoothies for that sort of thing. So I take my five bites while the dogs are watching me. They're 10 feet away from the bowl. There's food in both bowls. Then I give one of them permission to come and eat, say the command word when it takes their first bite. And I do not let the other dog come within seven feet. 
So now both dogs see that I am being impartial and protecting them. If she's eating and he's lingering, right, you know, trumping around behind her on the stage, then she's going to feel intimidated. So when she's eating, you're going to be uh, impartial and keep him away and vice versa. This way, both dogs see the humans have this under control. The humans are taking care of business, so I don't have to. All right. Uh, I use a kissing sound as my affirmation, and usually it works really well. He's uh, evidently, she's snoozing. Look at that. How about you come over here on this side? I'm going to wrap up this video. I don't want you stealing her food. There we go. All right, well, this is Molly, and this is Charlie, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you need it. Right, Charlie?